many good products were released in 2020. Some of these were outstanding price to performance. Others were competent entries that didn't outperform alternatives but did broaden the options available. I had a chance to review a number of excellent headphones this year. The Monolith M1570, Sifka Phoenix, Bass Audio G12, Allo Audio S4X, Aventone Planar, ATH R70X, and the Austrian Audio High X55 were all impressive in different respects. Now, at the tail end of 2020, Emotiva has released their first headphones. They call it the Airmotive GR1. It is $300, boasts audiophile quality marketing jargon, and aims to be your go-to headphone. Is the GR1 worth its price tag, or is it just another hype product? You cannot say that Emotiva was shy about marketing the GR1. Indeed, Emotiva is pushing hard for the GR1 to stand out among its competitors. There is a lot of vague, semi-relevant propositions from Emotiva, however. Emotiva says that the GR1 uses, quote, cutting-edge graphene infusion technology, a statement that seems like it was taken from a B-list Hollywood movie script. Emotiva says that their drivers are graphene-reinforced. Let's take a moment and talk about this. Emotiva is telling us that the drivers are not made principally of graphene. When they say that graphene is infused to reinforce the drivers, it means little graphene was used in the overall driver structure. So anybody who claims that the GR1 is made of graphene drivers is probably stretching the truth. The more accurate statement is that graphene is one component of the driver. Emotiva promises clean, clear, detailed, smooth, punchy sound signature. They claim that the semi-open back nature of the headphone results in, quote, incredible, smooth, natural, and open sound field. Emotiva promises exceptional comfort and stellar build. Let's put all of this to the test. Emotiva says that they put a lot of attention and time into designing the DR1. They used water jet machines, natural wood, aluminum ball bearings, fake leather, and memory foam. When first holding the GR1, the headphones give a positive first appearance. They are weighty, though not particularly heavy. They're heavier than the LCD-1, which is not difficult to do, but lighter than the M1060 or M1070. The weight is similar to that of the Sifka Phoenix and the M570. I could not find a plastic bit anywhere on the exterior. The wood ear cups are dark, and initially I thought they might just be metal. The wood finish is smooth, and upon close inspection, you can see the wood grains. The yoke is metal, the headband is metal, the grills are metal, the curvature of the yoke is fairly unique, along with the grills. The ear pads and headband are plush. They are soft. However, I think that the headband padding could have been increased. The included cable is one of the best I have ever used. It reminds me a lot of the Hart audio cables. The sheathing is pliable and soft. The 2.5mm prongs are covered with knurled metal, and both color and letter are identifiers on that metal piece. The 3.5mm prong is also covered with a metal housing and has a spring to relieve tension at critical points. I think that the cable is the perfect length at 6.5 feet. The GR1 has about average clamping force. I would say it's a little bit less than that of the HD6XX and similar to that of the Hi-Fi Mansundara. The ear cups do not sit fully around my ears. The top and bottom of my ears do get slightly pinched. This doesn't cause discomfort initially, but over time, say over several hours, it can get a little fatiguing. The headband is easily the most pressing issue because it is constantly pressing on the top of my head. I can feel a hotspot developing at the top. This headband is very similar to the one on the Monolith M570, and I would not be surprised if it's the same design. In the 570 review, I talked about how unnecessarily bulky, heavy, and uncomfortable the headband was. I think I have to say the same for the GR1. I don't understand why companies keep using this particular headband design. There are other curious oddities. My pair of brand new GR1 has a small indent on the left yoke. It is barely perceptible, but does stand out from the otherwise impeccable design. 
I'm a bit disappointed that Emotiva is using fake leather in this headphone. Real leather is not that expensive to source. The headband padding also should be a little bit thicker. The lack of swivel in the ear cups makes fitting less perfect than it could be. The ear cups move up and down, but horizontal movement should have been permitted. There's a tiny bit of give, but it's not the same thing. Overall, the fit and finish is pretty great. Comfort is about average. Anyone with average size ears might find the ear pads bending or pinching their ears, however. And you will either hate the headband or not think anything of it. Unfortunately, I'm not a fan of this headband and I think it merely accentuates the headphone's weight. To test the GR1, I use my Monolith Liquid Spark and Shitmodi 3 Stack. Both components are neutral. I played music through Amazon Music HD. The Liquid Spark has plenty of power to drive the GR1, which is 32 ohms. On high gain, I had to barely turn the volume knob from mute in order to get comfortable volume. On normal gain, I had the volume knob at just shy of 9 o'clock, which is not that far away from mute. In short, the GR1 is really easy to drive. Emotiva says that the GR1 has a frequency response of 23Hz to 24.5kHz. This explains the lack of high-res stickers, and I'm not bothered by that in the least. Emotiva says that the GR1 has powerful bass, which doesn't really say much. It turns out that the GR1 is just a tiny bit rolled off in sub-bass and has a slight mid-bass emphasis in comparison. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, there is a low rumble at the beginning of the song. It should be audible immediately. However, the GR1 presented that rumble at about 10 seconds into the song when the rumble is louder in the mix. The transients was about average, neither quick like a planar nor slow like a typical off-the-shelf dynamic driver headphone. I'd say it was about accurate in this regard. There was sub-bass and mid-bass melding. This presented a slightly thicker bass emphasis in the song. When the crescendo hit the middle of the track, the GR1 presented the organ powerfully. It melded heavily with other instruments, however. When the rolling thunder sound effect started at 2 minutes and 5 seconds into the song, it was recessed and melded with the other instruments. Some individual instruments were more easily audible than others. However, the overall impression was that all the instruments were essentially shoulder to shoulder, vying for attention. In Conquer by Overwork, there is a rolling marble sound at the beginning and pans from right to left to center. The GR1 recreated that sound with clarity, but it did not pan the sound. The sound remained fairly centered. There are a number of drums in this mix. Each drum strike seemed just a tiny bit blunted on the GR1. Increasing volume beyond safe listening volume levels did not alter that perception. The drums were not muddy or distorted, but they did seem as if a little bit of energy was missing. I could sometimes distinguish among the drums, but frankly, the drums tended to meld with each other more often than not. The synth was not harsh. I listened to several hip-hop tracks including Pure Water, Uproar, New Patek, and Reel It In. These tracks demonstrated the GR1's sub-bass roll-off. All of these songs have a subwoofer type effect, which was missing on the GR1. The GR1 did present sub-bass, but it seemed distant and hardly interacted with the mix. Indeed, it was more like the subwoofer was in another room. Mid-bass was more obvious, though it, there was some melding between it and the sub-bass. Vocals remained clear and were about two steps ahead. The requisite sparkle was always present without harshness. I listened to Bim Bam Smash from the Born Supremacy soundtrack. Here, I could easily tell that the mid-bass is slightly elevated. The drums were not as energetic or as clear as they could have been, however. Indeed, they tended to meld together. I could discern smaller snare drums from the bigger drums. At 1 minute and 15 seconds into the song, all the drums stop for a few seconds and a large drum smashes through the other sounds. This is timed to cars hitting each other in the movie. The GR1 recreated this drum, but it sounded just a little bit blunted, as if someone had draped a thin sheet over the speaker. In Irodori, a song by the Japanese band Kodo, the GR1 presented the various drums fairly well. All the drums melded, but upon close inspection, I could usually pick out one from the other. 
The drums seemed marginally blunted, their energy not quite what I've heard in many other headphones. Indeed, the feeling that a thin sheet was over the speakers returned. Overall, I'm neither disappointed nor elated with the bass performance. The sub-bass is not fully represented. The transient seems average and correct. Mid-bass impact is more obvious than sub-bass, and I would guess there's a slight emphasis. However, the major issue, I think, is the melding between sub-bass and mid-bass. That melding helps reduce clarity and might drain some energy from the drums. Emotiva doesn't say how the GR1 is supposed to present mids, and in my experience, it is not neutral in this headphone. Indeed, there seems to be a sibilance push that may be problematic for some people. In Orla Gartland's song, Why Am I Like This?, the track contains natural grain and sibilance. The GR1 accentuated both. The grain sounded a bit scratchy, almost like a hoarse voice. The sibilance was easily several decibels above neutral. It was not harsh, but it was pretty close to my personal threshold. The drums and guitar melded with each other and had about average decay. They seemed to have correct timbre. Orla's vocals remained two steps ahead and were always clear. Near the end of the song, a backup singer appeared. That backup singer sounded clear and remained in the right ear cup and about one step behind Orla. In Want You Back by Haim, the GR1 again accentuated the primary singer sibilance. It was not harsh, but it was getting close to my personal limit. At 8 seconds into the song, the primary singer stretches out the word WE and adds a gravelly emphasis. The GR1 perfectly recreated this detail. There are two backup vocalists who appear about 19 seconds into the song. They were clear with their individual tonalities in either ear cup. When the entire mix played at maximum, these backup vocalists melded heavily and it was not possible for me to distinguish their individual voices. When the other instruments played lightly, the vocalists again sounded clear. The drums, guitar, and piano all had proper timbre. They melded with each other, however. In Superposition by Young the Giant, the GR1 accurately recreated the drums and ukulele. The bass was a little bit recessed, but audible. All instruments had correct timbre and natural decay. The male vocalist was about two steps ahead of the mix. His sibilance seemed neutral. There was a bit of grain in his voice, but nothing like what I heard in songs with female vocalists. There is a backup vocalist in the song, and I almost heard him in the mix from time to time. Between 1 minute and 10 and 1 minute and 20 seconds of the song, there are sharp intakes of breaths. The GR1 perfectly recreated that detail. Overall, the mids are an interesting mix of clarity and a little bit of confusion. The female sibilance is clearly not neutral and male vocalists fare better as their sibilance is not accentuated. All instruments sounded correct, though they always melded. Depending on the track, you could either revel in the precise sound of multiple vocals or get overwhelmed by the potpourri of sounds when instruments played at maximum. I would not say that the mids are smooth. Vocals are pushed forward, which results in some potentially unwanted emphasis. Again, Emotiva does not say how the GR1 will perform with treble. It appears that treble in this headphone is the triumph. In Skirtso for X-Wings, the GR1 recreated the brass and horns with powerful clarity. These instruments had a bit more energy than true neutral, but were nowhere close to being harsh. I could hear the nasally, scratchy detail of the brass. The timpani was recessed and I almost missed it on the first listen. I could not hear individual instruments, but group sets were clear. The GR1 almost created a semicircle of instruments. Most headphones present this song in stereo left and right. A few, like the Aventone Planar and the Austrian Audio Hi X55, provide an expansive soundstage and make sounds come from extreme portions of the ear cups, resulting in a semicircle. The GR1 comes close to the semicircle sound presentation, but is just a bit shy of that mark. In Flight from the City by Johan Johansson, the piano sounded as if it was 10 feet away from me. The bassier notes did not distort and had about average decay. They seemed a little bit rolled off as well. I could hear the electric buzz in the track, though at times it was a bit recessed. 
The cello was clear and precise. Its signature melded with the piano marginally. I could hear the creaking of wood on the pianist's bench and the shifting of the cello. Some of these sounds were crystal clear. In take 5 by the Dave Brubeck Quartet, the GR1 presented the piano in the right ear cup, the drum kit in the left, the saxophone dead center, and the bass somewhere in the mix. The saxophone was easily ahead of the other instruments by two steps. It has slightly more energy than true neutral, but was not harsh. The drums were less emphasized, but the cymbals were clear and more obvious than the individual drum strikes. There was melding among all instruments, but nothing sounded muddy. I listened to the album John Williams in Vienna, a collection of orchestral mixes from popular movies. Track after track, the GR1 presented clear, powerful music. Brass and horns always pierced through the mixes without becoming harsh. Every track seemed to present the orchestra arrayed in a long line ahead of me. Overall, the treble response is probably the most engaging aspect of this headphone. Treble is elevated and pushed forward, but it's not harsh or peaky. Orchestral mixes sound energetic and clear. Throughout this video, I have tried to explain what details I could hear on the GR1. In this section, I will merely summarize my findings. The GR1 is not an analytical, detailed headphone. However, there are some details that it does produce clearly, and some less so. The creaking of wood, shifting of the weight of a cello, sharp intakes of breaths are all quite audible. But the sound of electric buzz, panning of drums, and perturbations caused by how cymbals are struck are either muted or missing. I think it's safe to say that the GR1 rarely misses obvious details. The one outlier was the panning of the rolling marble sound at the beginning of Conquer, but of course a lot of headphones miss that detail. There seems to be a crispness to the sound signature, and I know, this is entirely vague and unhelpful. In my view, crisp means a sound is immediate, obvious, sharp, and not melded with the other sounds. For the GR1, vocals are directly ahead of other elements. The strumming of guitars is clear and precise, clapping of hands is unmistakable. For a more quantitative test, I use the song New Light by Kazuki. This track has layers of details, including the sound of children playing, wind, rustling of grass, synth, and footsteps. I count the number of footsteps I can hear in the first 60 seconds. The king of detail retrieval so far is the Focal Clear, which presents 18 footsteps. The second best is the Austrian Audio High x 55 which presents 14 to 15 footsteps. The GR1 demonstrated 8 to 9 footsteps. Some of these were clear, some required very close listening. In comparison, the LCD1, HD6XX, and HD660S present about 6 to 7. The new HD560S presents 5 footsteps. This test confirms what I've been hearing on the GR1. There are some details that are unmistakable and some that seem recessed. But overall, the GR1 seems to provide slightly more clear details than other popular headphones. Emotiva says that the GR1 has a quote, open sound field. I really do not know what this means. The bottom line is that the GR1 has average to above average soundstage. It depends heavily on your recording. There are some headphones like the Hi X55 and Hi Fi Mandiva that make every recording sound wide. Then there are other headphones like the NDH20 and the DT1770, which make tracks sound far more intimate almost all the time. The GR1 seems to sit somewhere in between average and above average. I would say it has larger soundstage than the LCD-1 and the HD6XX, but less than the Sundara. The GR1 is not neutral. Let's get that out of the way. There is a slight sub-bass roll-off. There's a slight vocal push, one that is obvious with female artists. Treble is also accentuated. Maybe you can say that the GR1 is balanced, or maybe you believe that the GR1 is vocal and treble forward. The problem with generic labels like balanced and analytical is that they are always open to interpretation. 
Heck, so is the term neutral. This is why it's important we talk about specifics. I cannot say that the GR1 has a base boost, and I really don't think it does. The base certainly is not bloated. Instead, the sub-base is a bit rolled off. Emotiva says that the GR1 reproduces down to 23Hz, which is above the average human hearing threshold for bass, and I think that helps explain some of the loss of sub-bass presence. Mid-bass seems close to neutral, but might have a marginal accentuation. Drum strikes, however, sound just a bit blunted. It seems that some energy is missing. The sharp thwack of a drumstick hitting the drum is not recreated faithfully, at least not in my opinion. Mid-instruments all have correct timbre and average decay, but they take a back seat to vocals. On every track I tested, male and female vocals were always two steps ahead. This was somewhat problematic for female vocals where sibilance is present. Male vocals don't have the same sibilance issue. The treble is energetic and elevated. The tuning on the GR1, however, keeps the treble in check. Never did it become harsh or fatiguing. There is above average clarity in treble instruments and orchestral tracks benefit from the GR1's performance. Soundstage is average to above average. Detail retrieval is, technically, above average. I usually don't say that a particular genre is suited to a headphone, but on this occasion, I think I have to. Orchestral tracks shine on the GR1. The GR1 is facing stiff competition against other headphones. The HD6XX and Sivka Phoenix are cheaper. So what does the GR1 offer for a higher price tag? That's a question we need to answer later when we do comparisons. For this video, we simply need to find out if there is anything amiss with the GR1. That is, does the GR1 have any significant faults or concerns that should make people cautious? There are a few things that stand out about the GR1. The GR1's build is exemplary. This is a sturdy, robust headphone. It's unfortunate that my unit has a little bit of a dent on the yoke, but manufacturing defects like this will happen from time to time. I'm a bit annoyed with the use of fake leather. Look, this isn't a cheap headphone, so I don't see why Emotiva opted for this. Sure, it's not a big deal since the earpads do have memory foam, a feature that some expensive headphones lack. But the greater issue, for a lot of people, will be the size of the earpads. If you enjoyed the Phoenix, for example, but hated the earpads, then the GR1 is going to make you grumpy. The headband padding is subpar. Indeed, I don't see any rational basis for using this headband design at all. It was a pain on the M570 and it's a pain here. The GR1 does come with agreeable accessories. The carrying case is no different from that of the Sandy Ava and Sivka Phoenix and frankly is fantastic. The GR1 cable is soft, pliable, and well constructed. The sound signature is either going to be to your liking or not. I don't think that the sub bass roll off is that big an issue. You can EQ that. The treble emphasis, I think, seems to be well controlled. But the sibilant spike for female vocals can be a huge deciding factor for some. It's rather unfortunate that the last two headphones I've tested exhibit the same problem. The HD560S has a painful sibilant spike. The GR1 is not that bad, but it is noticeable. Just as with the 560S, you can try to EQ the sibilance. The problem is that you should not have to. In my view, if a headphone needs a bit of adjustment here and there, then that's just your sound preference. No headphone will sound exactly like you want. But when you have to EQ to make a headphone less painful, that is unforgivable. So while I think that the GR1 is easier on the ears than the 560, it is still a little disappointing to deal with the sibilance. Some people might be perfectly fine with the sibilance. Some might say that they don't hear it. Well, that depends a lot on your music and source. This brings us to value. I've spoken to a few industry experts about how headphones are designed. 
My understanding is that unless it's expressly clear that the manufacturer has made the headphones in-house, a lot of headphones are built in the same factories using very similar components in China. Chinese companies will experiment with different driver structures and have ready-to-fabricate designs. An audio gear company will pick a catalog of options and slap its name on the end result. I've been told by one manufacturer that they went to China to pick out two specific product types. They wanted to offer that type of product but did not have the expertise to make it in-house. So off they went to China, looked at various designs, listened to their favorite options, and picked two products that fit within their budget. And now those products are sold with the manufacturer's name on them. I'm telling you all of this because I have no idea where Emotiva got the GR1. Did they make it in-house? If so, they should proudly say so. But it's nowhere in their marketing. The packaging says made in China for whatever that's worth. The more I look at the GR1, the more I see similarities with the M570 and the Phoenix. Yeah, the GR1 has graphene coated drivers while the 570 and Phoenix do not. And yes, there are obvious physical differences as well. But I do wonder, what was Emotiva's goal? Was it simply to offer a pair of headphones in this hyped headphone market? Or did they have a vision? Are headphones a hobby for Emotiva or are they serious? I'm asking because I want to know if they intend to make this product better in the future. I'm struggling to justify $300 for the GR1. Don't get me wrong, I would love to say that this headphone is fantastic, but I'm not sure about that, at least not yet. $300 is a hefty price tag, especially with cheaper competitors nipping at the heels. The Phoenix and HD6XX come to mind immediately. So the GR1 has to offer something materially different to justify its increased price. The build is great, but there are mistakes that will make this headphone uncomfortable for some. The sound signature is agreeable, but anyone who hates sibilance will dislike this headphone. The treble is energetic and controlled, and it is a testament to good tuning. You do not need that stupid high-res sticker to get clear, well-extended treble. Here, their GR1 without question shows that you can tune your headphones well below the high-res requirement and get good performance. I see a lot of positives here. Comfort is a personal preference, and what I find a little uncomfortable may not bother you. Sound signature is also a personal preference. My dislike for the sibilant spike may have no effect on you. But I have to review headphones as I experience them. And at this point, I am not prepared to say that the GR1 is value. I am not discounting the possibility that it is good value. I'm simply not going to jump up and declare that it is. I think A and B testing is necessary to provide a much clearer picture. To that end, in the near future, we will compare the GR1 to the Phoenix and the HD6XX.